this is Arlene. Hi, this is Gauri. And you're listening to Durian Asia and the Voice of Discovery and Sharing. Today in our ABC Dialogue, we have a guest from uh, mm. all the way from Indonesia. We are currently <coughs> Skyping with him. Which, his name is Harjo Winoto. He's a lawyer and also a consultant. Hi. 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 Uh, so anyway, congrats, congratulations to you and also the rest of Indonesia for um, having a new president of yeah. Indonesia, uh, which is Jokowi, uh, popularly, popularly named as Jokowi. What do, you, what do you feel about this? Do you feel excited or do you feel like, oh, this is a new Indonesia that we are going, you know, for, we are pushing forward, you know, into the future? What I feel, um, I feel excited for sure. Um, this is the first election that I follow um, in quite um, rigorous details, I guess, um, so to speak. Um, and Joko is a new face. Um, the only presidential candidate that has nothing to do with the old regime. So I feel really excited. Mm. And um, how much did you know about Jokowi and also Prabowo, if you can describe it to us based on your understanding <clears throat> of Indonesian politics? Um, well, let me just put it this way. Uh, Jokowi is the kind of, you know, good neighbor guy. Um, the kind of guy that um, Obama tries to portray, uh, except that Obama has a degree from Harvard. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, um, Jokowi basically was a... a Furniture's businessman in a very small area from Indonesia. He has never been in the elite world. Uh, no fancy title uh, like constitutional court um, judge or a, a politician title. Um, he's a very simple, mm -hmm. uh, good neighbor guy. Um, but do you think? Do, but do you think this is actually? I mean, not being <clears throat> tied down, tied tied up to the elitist class. Is it something of a disadvantage for him or something that is actually, you know, it's good that he comes from a different sort of social class? What do you think about it? It is a good thing. It's a good thing because uh, Indonesian people are generally very sick of the elitist kind of uh, candidates from years to years. I mean, after the 1998 reform and our constitutional uh, reform, Nothing has much changed in terms of the people who are in the position of power. And people want to see, you know, a, a fresh face, something, some, something like Obama. That's why I, I would personally describe Jokowi as someone who resembles the charisma of Obama. First mm -hmm. African-American to hold the office in a very white country. Mm -hmm. Do you think Jokowi lived up to the expectation during the campaign period of society in Indonesia? Like, did he manage to gain the support of every different ethnicity and also social groups in Indonesia? Or is it really a divided Indonesia in terms of uh, 2014 and beyond? Well, the poll rank shows that, uh, I just received the news this morning, uh, that the official result, not the quick count, has been released by the, uh, we call it KPU. Uh, it's a... General Election Commission, basically, who is responsible for counting and recapitulation. Um, and Jokowi uh, won by 53%. So it's pretty tight, 3%. But if I have to translate into numbers, it's averagely 1.5 million votes, 1%. So he led by 4.5 million. But that's still tight. So when you ask me, is it divided? Yes, it is. It is still divided. Mm -hmm. But... What among the people who are divided in that vote, um, I would say that uh, Jokowi grabbed demographically more ethnicity than Prabowo, mm -hmm. based on the poll. What about Prabowo? What is your view on him? Well, he belongs to the, he, you know, um, as a matter of fact, he was uh, an ex-military general who, were, who was implicated in the Timor um, incident and international organizations such as United Nations based on the human rights convention such as the Rome Statute and the ICC um, well classifies as a war crime offender although no trial has actually been carried out on this matter but he was alleged or implicated mm -hmm. so my view is that he still belonged to that group of military leaders 
that mark the Suharto's administration. Mm -hmm. And um, it seems like those <clears throat> that supported uh, uh, Prabowo are those that are of a certain social class, I would say the middle class, and also uh, generally for those who are much more inclined towards religion. So do you see Prabowo as the conservative, as in like, if you put it in an American term, would be the Republican image that he's trying to portray? Yes, in fact it is. Uh, if I can just draw a, a, a simple comparison, right? Um, since you mentioned the conservative term in the context of the U.S., uh, issues such as <coughs> LGBT, for example, he's against it. Um, he is uh, anti-abortion. Uh, um, at least his uh, political views, um, not personal views, uh, political views that he projected, uh, has a conservative sense and nuances that general conservative of Republicans in the U.S. projected. So yes, uh, in, this, in that sense, he is conservative in the context of U.S. Mm -hmm. politics. Mm -hmm. so, we, um, so during the election campaign itself and also uh, during the, the voting campaign, uh, uh, d during the voting period itself, uh, what was your experience? Uh, did, did you feel a different sort of election that is happening compared to during the uh, Susilo Bambang and also during Megawati and uh, um, uh, and the, the previous ones that uh, the, the the previous one the the previous presidents <clears throat> that were being elected after the fall of Suharto? Yes. Yes. The difference, I guess, primarily, if I can just draw one example from this election, is that um, Jokowi was very well known for his one particular trait. He's the kind of guy that goes into uh, the field, or uh, you know, um, when he was running as the governor, if there were problems with the sewer uh, or irrigate um, water system, he will actually go there, mm -hmm. look for himself. And a place in order to uh, have it fixed right on the spot. Uh, the kind of guy who doesn't um, talk too much but mm -hmm. work a lot. Mm -hmm. You know that that is kind of portray that is the exact opposite of most elitists who are throwing empty rhetorics about change, uh, empowerment, uh, woman empowerment, uh, and all these big issues in Indonesia. So in that sense, yeah, that is a major change uh, in terms of the color of the candidates of this presidential election. Why do you think he is more grassroots compared to other leaders? What actually shaped him to be the person that he is now? <clears throat> I would say it's because he came from the background of businessman. And in Indonesia, we call it Ndeso, Desa. I guess in Malay word, it's, 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 a, it's a comparative word, right? Deso means village. He came uh, from that background. Oh, desa. In Malaysia, I think desa. it would be desa or kampung. Desa. Yeah. Kampung. Um, yeah, kampung is the right word. Uh, desa. He came from that background and became a businessman. And all his focus is on result. Uh, and his, his, his principle is basically work. You know, when he was... Uh, he cared a lot less about uh, political opposition, like, you know, generally in politics, right? You mm -hmm. see a policy. The content is good. The mechanism is good, the idea is good, the implementation is good. But a lot of politicians care about who will it, this policy will offend and whether it will create more political enemy. Oh. He's the kind of guy who doesn't care about that. Oh, this is interesting. Uh, in Malaysia, it would be like everything is good except that the implementation <laughs> or nah. deli the delivery is delivery. bad. <laughs> that that well, would be in the case of Malaysia. <laughs> I, would, I would say that's the case with every politi uh, politics in every country, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that the, the, the famous quip is all politicians disappoint. The question is only to what extent, <laughs> <laughs> which is the joke, right? Yeah. But um, I guess what Jokowi portrayed, and I think I, I cannot um, stress this enough, that he's the kind of guy who doesn't do much calculation in terms whom this policy will offend. He will just go with it because he knows uh, this policy is good, the result is good for the people, uh, the idea is well-shaped, and the execution is perfect. He's that kind of guy. Um, so for you, as an Indonesian, um, what, 
I I mean as a new generation of Indonesian, young Indonesian, uh, what what do you think like uh, the collective view of the youth in Indonesia would be like they came I think a lot of young the younger generation they are very much attached <coughs> to technology, uh, yeah. they they I think they they are their their future idea of ideal uh idea of ideal Indonesia would probably be dissimilar with uh, the older generation. I think they probably look forward to an Indonesia that would be much more economically prosperous. Uh, and when I say economically prosperous, meaning that uh, it would be a much more equal society rather than having like a very, uh, uh, you know, having the very rich and the very poor, you know, living side by side. Um, but what would you say, you know, as a, a, a young Indonesian yourself, what would you say about this? Um, if I'm getting your question right, you're asking whether, um, how would our, in terms of development economic policy, uh, would Indonesia look like when jo- uh, in Jokowi's term or mm-hmm. administration? Right? Yeah. I, I, but am in, I in the perspective of Indonesian's youth. In the perspective of Indonesian youth. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess that's what I'm saying. Uh, um, generally, the social, political, sort of, um, how do I put it correctly? Social political culture in Southeast Asia is very patriarchal, right? Mm-hmm. Seniority over performance. I guess that's the best way to describe seniority over performance. And uh, he's the kind of guy that's against it. Mm-hmm. So, as he, a, his as, background, what about his ethnic <clears throat> background? Is he a Javanese? Yes, he is a Javanese. But I thought Javanese culture is very much patriarchal when it comes to the social order. It is true, but Jokowi is in a revolutionary in his view about how to run a government uh, and a business, basically. Mm-hmm. So I guess that background has not much has not much bearing in terms of how he see a, a government or an administration should be run. Mm-hmm. And since I'm answering a question in terms of youth's perspective, the issue is then uh, whether youth gets more opportunity in the new administration and thing, yeah. In fact, his campaign team uh, mostly is filled with this kind of, you know, youth who understand international issues, um, who is into social media, uh, who understands and advocate values such as uh, liberal views on uh, LGBT, women rights, uh, etc. So I can sense that he is going to that direction in terms of youth. Can you highlight a few of his campaign manifesto that you found to be something that is encouraging, something that you would look forward towards? Uh, Mental Revolution uh, is the famous campaign. And the Salam uh, Dua Jari. Salam Dua Jari. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but that has no sort of political content. Right? I mean, mm-hmm. Mental Revolutions are uh, a sort of campaign to say that um, what needs to change is not policy white on uh, black on white, right? We have t- so much rhetoric, so much law written, but we need to change uh, our mentality in approaching issues and situations. Uh, and it's very <clears throat> philosophical, I would say, on my point of view, about how you change your mentality. You can erect a great constitutional court field with nine completely smart Harvard educated judges, but if their mentality is uh, rent seeking, that's a jargon we use in public policies, rent seeking, then nothing will change. Mm-hmm. Um, he's the kind of guy with that kind of approach. Mm-hmm. Uh, in, uh, revolution, uh, in mental revolution, I think is is an ideological reform that Jokowi wants to put into the minds of every Indonesian. But in terms of the current situation right now, how bad it is that uh, that you know that we need such a um, mental <clears throat> revolution what what is the current situation right now as in, as in like in terms of the way uh, society function corruption uh, crimes uh, social issues and all that well i cannot answer that that's a, such a big question it's like um I, I will answer them with examples but um i'm just putting a caveat like you are trying you are asking me to describe an elephant and i'm only touching his tail or trunk right mm-hmm. so i mean <laughs> You I know, mean, um, if you can give just one example of one example how, uh, that probably touches, uh, uh, probably touches, you know, issues that related to the the young, 
the younger generation of Indonesia what kind of mental revolution what, why a mental revolution is needed especially you know when I'm, I'm talking about the that that particular social group <clears throat> all right um I think I will go back to the issue of seniority over performance, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, as you guys may have sensed it in Malaysia yourself, uh, this is what happens when you go to any uh, civil service as a civil servant. <clears throat> um, you can work 18 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, you work 10 times harder than a senior. You are 10 times smarter than your senior, but they are paid 20 times better. Mm-hmm. Um and that is a new job or performance. The joke that I, uh, we usually crack about it is that you have to wait for your senior to die before you can actually replace him or her. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, um, or, or he, he moved on and got promoted, you know. Um, so in terms of youth, uh, what we're seeing that um, <clears throat> with the proliferations of internet, social media, access and information, uh, youth has been getting the upper hand in terms of understanding a situation in politics in certain department mm. and I, I i sense that at least in comparison to prabowo that is changing a lot faster in the hand of jokowi so to answer your question in a straightforward manner it there's a huge implication in terms of what kind of leaders you're going to see in each department youth are going to be uh, the compositions of young people in during Jokowi's uh, administration will be, will increase uh, in a significant amount of number. Mm-hmm. Um, another part that I think uh, would be important is the area related to religious <coughs> freedom. How mm-hmm. how much change that do you think Jokowi would do in terms of ensuring there is religious freedom in this country? Um, okay, um... To answer the question, I guess I'll pinpoint to the uh, campaign situation. Um, He has never raised any issue in religion. Uh, To me, that seems that he is religion blind. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, uh, His personal view of religion has no bearing on, um, for example, his supporters. I mean, uh, he doesn't care about it. Uh, He doesn't talk about it. Uh, he has never highlighted in any of his campaign message. Mm-hmm. While in Prabowo's part, it is still very dense. It's, it's very, it's kind of clear. For example, one of the coalition that supported Prabowo uh, is PKS in Indonesia. What yeah, PKS is a, a, a quite a conservative Islamic group um, mm-hmm. who recently, for example, pushed for uh, anti-pornography law. Uh, among the content is what implicates women in terms of uh, how women dress, uh, the implementation of strict Sharia law. That Islamic uh, party uh, is part of Prabowo coalition. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of clear to me or anyone basically in Indonesia that Prabowo will have to at least run on that direction. Well, Jokowi has not even mentioned um, any religious uh, direction in terms of his his campaign, which indicates what his policy is going to look like. Mm-hmm. But in the case of Malaysia, uh, race and religion play a significant amount of influence <clears throat> in terms of how the politics function in this country. Um, for I mean, I just give a simple example when it comes to Islam. It has been so institutionalized that people are starting to feel that it's becoming a more religious um, society, I, I mean, uh, state. And society in this uh, in Malaysia, and uh, when it comes to politicians, they are very much scared in terms of even to use the word pluralism. It's actually a word that is considered <laughs> banned in this country. Uh, mm. li- the same with liberal liberalism and all that. But I I'm sure in the context of Indonesia it would probably be different. But how? But but at the same time, we I, we can't help that in terms of Southeast Asia. A lot of majority of the Southeast Asian country, including Singapore, even though it's a secular, it's, it's a secular, a secular nation, it seems like it's gearing towards a more, uh, fundamental belief, um, or fundamental direction of religion. But in terms of, uh, the political candidate, um, Jokowi <coughs> and Prabowo, although they are very different in their views, but how much 
of this um uh of their personality and their policy would affect the the religious freedom and religious uh harmony <coughs> of Indonesia and would he be do you do you think in your belief uh he would promote more um tolerant and he would be more harsher towards fundamentalism in Indonesia um my direct answer would be yes he will be to what extent that is still subject to the test of time and political constraint that he has but the reason why there are so many uh, and this is what Prabowo, Prabowo basically used as a weapon in terms of negative campaign it is discredit Prabowo as a a non-islam kind of guy uh, you know uh, while his uh, Jokowi's religion is islam so if you ask me whether um, his policy will be directed toward a, a more tolerant, plural or liberal society, my answer is yes. Again, my caveat is to what extent is still subject to the test of time. Uh, in terms of your second question, in terms of whether he will be harsher to fundamentalism, um, I guess it will be really subject to the test of time. I mean, I, I personally... Uh, um, I'm very sort of uh, curious as to how he would react to it. Uh, if there's a, for example, one of the biggest issue in Indonesia is with regard to the uh, state permit mm -hmm. to build a religious buildings, mm -hmm. such as a particular church and mosque. Uh, there's been numerous amounts of incidents in many other rural areas where. Um, Churches, uh, church buildings were being shut down uh, by the issuance or enactment of law, while mosques are allowed to be um, uh, new mosques are allowed to be built, so the legal standard or permit are different. So you know, what I mean, uh, the government says that the church building doesn't qualify for the permit because the laws, uh, the legal requirement, have not been fulfilled. While in the case of mosques, the same situation arises. Uh, those mosques uh, management has not fulfilled all the legal criteria, but they are there anyway, you know. That kind of discrimination in terms of legal policy, it happens a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I will personally say that Jokowi will be a lot more attentive to those issues in terms of um, making sure that the law and administrations treat at least in the context of Christian and Muslim more equally. To what extent are still subject to the test of time? Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, we will take a short break, uh, but when we return back, more discussion will be uh, coming up from uh, me and also Harjo Winoto. We are back now with Arlene and also Arjo Winoto, uh, our guest for today, to discuss about Indonesia's presidential election, uh, uh, which is uh, the, the newly elected Jokowi. Will he be another Obama? Um, so I want to raise a question about Obama because um, the first thing is uh, during 2008 and also the subsequent uh, election, Obama is a very popular president in Indonesia uh, sorry sorry in America and and among the public I think a lot of a majority of uh, Americans are very much in support of Obama's policy and his idealism but at the same time uh, more and more, more and more people got frustrated throughout the years because he seems not to be able to deliver his campaign promises fast and some of it that he, uh, some, some of his campaign promises he can't even deliver at all um i just give example of his healthcare policy uh the obamacare which is popularly popularly known it seems like he's able to gain widespread support among the public but not when it comes to the Congress, uh, which is equi equivalent to the parliamentary uh, system, uh, to, to the parliamentary system in Malaysia. So the Congress seems to be very much hesitant towards his uh, policy, and even the media as well, which uh, majority of them are being controlled by um, uh, people who support uh, the Republicans. And with that, it seems like 
um, Obama gained a lot of support with the public, but not among politicians and the elitist groups themselves. And with Jokowi, uh, what I see is diff, uh, th that what I see him is he's similar in the state in the situation like Obama, like he can gain a lot of public support, but when it comes to the parliament or the Congress in Indonesia. I am not very confident about it. It seems like uh, he doesn't gel well probably with the elitist groups. And uh, also, uh, I have to compare to the politics in Malaysia because in Malaysia, as well as in Singapore, the executive have a lot of power. Um, in fact, the executive has such a tremendous power that any policy that comes up from the executive will very much be supported by majority of those in the parliament as well as, well as in as the executive and in the other parts of uh, other area of instit institutions that is part of the government. Um, my question to you, um, <laughs> with so many backgrounds that I described just now, is uh, do you think Jokowi will be the next Obama or do you think that he's able to gain support within the masses as well as within the government and politicians themselves? Mm -hmm. um, well, that's, that's indeed a lot, very long context. Huh? <laughs> yeah. So let me try to break it down to uh, several points, I guess. Uh, the first point is whether, realistically speaking, um, uh, he will live up to the expectation in the context of the parliament and executive power. Um, I guess I'll pinpoint it to the historical background, right? Um, you know, the, the story of Suharto, 32 years of reigning, um, uh, a most an absolute power in executive, and the parliament is basically just a puppet of dummy. Um, and because of that historical trauma um, during the reformacy, in 1998, which is reflected in the um, tremendous and um, tremendous and significant or fundamental change in our constitution, uh, <clears throat> this the consensus was to shift the power that originally belonged to the executive to the parliament or legislative body. So it's, it's something like the South Africa experience where they throw away everything from the previous regime uh, during the, you know, the sort of reform process after the apartheid regime, uh, including when I say throw everything, literally the good and bad things all together, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that gives rise to sort of a power clenching, I guess that's the word, of the parliament. Um, and this is where I get into specific points. For example... Say the government has a policy uh, or um, wants to enact a law with regard to infrastructure or access to education. Um, at least there's one power in the <clears throat> parliament hand, which is uh, budgeting. Uh, it means that you can have the best, most implementable, most uh, uh, most implemented, the best uh, policy. You drafted the law, but the parliament can still um, make a living life out of the executive through budgeting process. And of course, the final approval is on the hand of the parliament. Um, and that's the case with the uh, uh, SBY's regime in the second term, where he gained, he, he lost a lot of parliament support uh, due to some political coalition's problems that he has from the first term. And he has a lot of problems in ex executing his uh, his policy. Mm -hmm. And this trend seems to be growing. Parliament seems to be more, more powerful because they make a law about themselves. You know, um, for example, the recent draft or bill uh, regarding the power of our parliament, uh, among many other provisions in the in the draft or the bill of the new law, is one on corruption allegation, our KPK, which is Corruption Eradication Commission, uh, has to acquire a permission from the <clears throat> a special body that will be established within DPR, uh, with, with the executive, the president, in order to even begin investigation. This was not the case before. So if the uh, Corruption Commission uh, suspected or gained preliminary evidence to investigate a corruption case, they could just go ahead with it. But with the new law 
or the, the bill that is being drafted and being debated, uh, the Corruption Commission has to go through a procedure, which is acquiring permission from the executive. There are a lot of other provisions that make uh, enlarge the portion of power of parliament in terms of politics and make it a lot more difficult for the executives to implement their policies. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of the, the first, uh, the context I will draw and the examples that I will summon in, in how to respond to your questions. So yeah, Joko will face a lot of problems with in terms of parliament what, uh, what, what, do you, what do you think that Jokowi should do to gain friends within within the parliament, uh, within his, not just his own party or <clears throat> party that uh, that would want to affiliate it with him, but like even within enemy lines, like how can he gain support? Like how did uh, the Clinton administration in America gain support widely, not just within the, the Democrats, also within the De uh, Republicans? It's so well liked that even after so many years that he has resigned from, uh, he has, um, uh, resigned from his duty as uh, the president of America, he's still seen as a person that is relevant in American politics. Whatever he said is being seen as something intelligent, something that uh, bo uh, yeah. um, politicians from both camps would accept it. So for in your opinion, what should Jokowi do to win friends? It depends on what he wants or the objective. It's interesting that you mentioned um, Bill Clinton. Mm -hmm. Because I recently read an article about him and his relevance in women administration. You know, uh, the, the, the joke was uh, he can explain everything. I mean, Clinton can explain everything. If there's a, a specific department or post for him, it will be the department of explaining <laughs> to, the re <laughs> you know, to the rest of the world or to, to American citizens, all classes, about what the, the rationale or the purpose or the aim of certain policy of America He's good at that, Clinton. Um, so why did I mention this? Uh, it depends on what Jokowi wants, right? Do you want people to accept your policy? So there's a sort of a trade-off between uh, the effectiveness of a policy and pleasing or not to offend too many parties, uh, your, your opponents for sure. Or you would go ahead with certain policy that you know is good, that people know is good, at the cause of creating more enemies. So it really depends on what he wants um, and how he wants to, what kind of style that he wants to put in into action. Um, my view is that he should balance the two. <clears throat> uh, well, you know, in politics, you realistically, realistically speaking, you always need allies to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you have to make everyone agree with you, but at least there will be a, a reasonable and significant amount of uh, political uh, buddies of parliament members that will support you one way or another. Um, and that will be the trade-off between popular policy and good quality policies in a way, uh, so to speak. I mean, uh, he needs to be able to play that card well. And judging from his background, he will have to work a lot more on the side of pleasing people rather than creating good quality policies. He's good at creating it. Mm -hmm. Whether he can sell it well, it aligning, another, that is another issue. So in other and words, he, he has to be a good salesman, <laughs> a marketing or he person. Has, in, a, in a way, uh, I wouldn't put it marketing as in, you know, marketing a product, but uh, in terms of how to be able to play his card well, align his policy with the interests of exist, uh, his opponents. So either he has to be a good salesman, so to speak, quote unquote, or he has to hire a person who is good enough to sell it. Do you think his uh, vice president would be good enough, Kala? Um, no, no. Um, Yusuf Kala is a, uh, has a strong... I mean, he's popular because he's, he has Jokowi style. Uh, do you, when he was the uh, <clears throat> uh, vice president of SB in the first term, uh, he's famous among businessmen, entrepreneurs. Because that uh, he act, acted fast. If there are issues and situation, he acted instead of throwing empty rhetorics. Mm -hmm. um, so he he sort of has that Jokowi style. And during the presidential debate, the first, second, and third presidential debate, I personally don't follow all of them in full, but I read a great deal about it. You can immediately sense he is the kind of guy who is 
straightforward, um, <clears throat> who is not hesitant on pointing the mistakes of the opponents in such a straightforward manner. And I will personally say he is not a really good salesman. Mm-hmm. Um, my qu- fi- my my question about their foreign policy, um, when it comes to Jokowi and uh, Joseph Kala, do you think Jokowi would want ASEAN to be a significant regional body in the uh, in the future? Because nowadays, I think a lot of people realize that ASEAN's influence in the world has become m- more and more important but at the same time it is unable to keep up with that uh that sort of intensity unlike you know regional bodies like eu um and also uh, asean also is weak in terms of a lot of its difference mechanism and i think i want to highlight its human rights mechanism as well its uh, human rights charter is still considered very much a very weak charter uh, as an as an, as an example so with you i mean with your thoughts do you think uh Jokowi and Yusuf Kala would want ASEAN to be something significant and push forward for that? Um, I will answer that in terms of comparison um, with Prabowo. Prabowo is definitely a very um, conservative sort of party coming from the sort of background as we have talked about. So in terms of comparison, Prabowo, if I can put it in a very succinct way, will put a lot less attention, much less attention to ASEAN than Jokowi would. Mm-hmm. Uh, his, one of his main selling points during the campaign is uh, na- uh, economic nationalism. In fact, he talked about renegotiating oil contracts and so on and so forth. So it seems to me at least that on in comparison terms, Prabowo will be the kind of guy who says, you know, um, we don't care about foreign companies and foreign institutions. We can um, survive on our own and we don't need them. That's the kind of message that he's sending. Joko mm-hmm. is much more neutral on that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess it's probably because he came from a background where um, he's not very much acquainted with this, this kind of international institution and politi- political mechanism, regional integration issue. Um, but it, it, uh, if that is the case, and I personally believe that's the case, that it means that Jokowi has simply not made any stance with regard to ASEAN. Mm. He has neither refused nor accepted it. But I'm more inclined to say that from his personality and his out, uh, out, uh, his view about um, policy, he would be much more inclined to support and foster it rather than to disagree with it. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, with that, I just want to say thank you, Harjo Winoto, for expressing your views uh, related Uh, on Jokowi as well as the Indonesia uh, politics in general. Uh, I wish all the best with uh, Indonesia's new president, Jokowi. I hope that his administration will bring much more prosperity within the Indonesian society as well as this region. You know, I think a lot of uh, Malaysians are looking forward to Jokowi as well, including myself. So uh, thank you, Haju. My pleasure.